Okay, so thank you everyone um, for joining us today for um, 15 Minute Parenting with Joanna Fortune. This is a fab book. I've got here the zero to seven years, but there are three books in the series covering um, zero to seven, eight to 12, and then the teen years as well. So Joanna has very kindly agreed to join the Frollo community today, talk through the concept of 15 Minute Parenting, and then um, you know, talk through some, some specific techniques in, in more detail. So over to you, Joanna. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm delighted uh, to talk to everybody about it. And thanks for embracing 15 minute parenting so openly. And I, you know, I just, to start, I think what you're all doing is tremendous tremendous and I don't think we as parents give ourselves enough credit for how tremendous we are so I I really think that you know and I hope 15 minute parenting emphasizes that that in you held up there the zero to seven book at the beginning of that as you know the first couple of chapters are really about us as parents and really looking at how we're our best parenting resource and by deepening our understanding of our own stuff and you start from a place of open, welcoming in, we all have stuff. We all have buttons to be pushed. We all have triggers to be activated. And we have to get to know that about ourselves. So it's a, a journey of going inwards to parent outwards. And I think that that's something that people have found really helpful, that it, this isn't a book or a series about changing your child's behavior and looking at what is that child doing and how do I make them stop? It's really about how do I secure and strengthen connection so that we achieve behavioral correction? And you don't get the correction without the connection. And for me, that's really, really important because too many behavior modification systems pathologize what might be, and I'll put my hand up and say, what might be very unpleasant behaviors in our children, but are actually their bid to convey something to us. Their bid to say, hey, it's not working. I'm out of sorts, but I don't have the emotional fluency to say I'm feeling overwhelmed and perturbed by what life has thrown at me today. Shall we sit and talk about it? Instead, they flip their lids and they lose it and they go through all of that. And I think that that's something that, is, is central to this piece. It's really about using play as a language for children because they don't have the cognitive or emotional language, as I've just said, but they do have their play. And play for children isn't just something nice that they do. Play is essential. It is how they learn. And I really want to emphasize that at the moment because we're all doing the old homeschooling or you know supported learning whatever language we want to call it um, we're all doing that dance at the moment uh, with with enhanced restrictions um, um, at the, and I think when we think about that we think about how do I get them to sit still at the table how do I get them to do all of this homework or all of this assignment all they want is snacks all they want is to move all they want is to show me something else that's going on elsewhere and I'm just like of course they do I mean children are motivated by what's interesting to them and if I had a choice to sit down at the table and do some pages of of maths or pages of English vocab or I could build a tower of blocks with you I'm totally going to build a tower of blocks. You know, of course I am. So I, I really think just to give ourselves a break and say that if we can shift our understanding of play, that play is not a box of toys in the corner of a room. Play is a state of mind and a way of being. Parenting is about connection and play fuels connection. So when it comes to these days or indeed any days, but getting going into our homeschooling or the structured piece that we're doing, start with play. Okay, start with something creative, start with something playful, start with something fun, because what that does is it lowers my resistances. I'm not coming at you with, but I don't want to. I'm coming at you with, oh yeah, let's do that. I'm into that. You get your 15 minutes of play done and then you say, okay, now we're going to just do a little bit of work and then we get to play again. And one of the things that I like to do, because, you know, time is such an abstract notion for children, maybe for some of us adults too, but definitely for children, that you say to them, we're going to play for 15 minutes. You may as well say, we're going to play for two weeks. It, it doesn't mean anything. All they know is 
you're telling me it's going to end. So now I've already got to get on edge that I don't want it to end. But if you have something visual, and I use these, this is a 15 minute timer actually. Um, and I say, you know, we're gonna play till all the sound hits the bottom. And then we've got to do some jobs. Okay, and then when the sand hits the bottom, I switch it and say, and we got to sit at the table and do our, our maths until all the sand hits the bottom. And then we're going to have a snack. And then we do one more turn. And that's 30 minutes then of schoolwork. I'm well due a play and movement break by then. But this is your visual structure because the advantage with this over setting an alarm on your phone or having the oven clock bing at a particular time is when I hear the beep or the bing, it's still happening to me. When I see my time going, it's happening with me. I get to see I have time left. It's running out. It's nearly gone it's gone. I have actually moved with that. And it's much more regulating. And I think that that's very helpful as well, because when it's happening with me rather than to me, again, you've got my connection and engagement in there. And then it's about, you know, when we talk about play as a language, I mean, it's really about understanding what do we mean by play? How do we as adults deepen our understanding? Now, look, we've all been children. We have that advantage, but we've all had a very different experience of being children and being parented as children. And again, the beginning of the, of the model brings in a lot of, you know, how did you, not how were you parented, but how did you experience being parented? How do you now recall it? And what of those experiences are influencing you going forward? And in the parental self audit, which is a list of questions that I invite people to sit down before they really at the very beginning of the book, before you commence the rest um, and ask, we're great at asking ourselves questions, aren't we? We're not so great at answering them. So it's really important that we answer the questions that we're asking. We don't just say, oh, I wonder about that and then hop on to something else, but actually wonder and think that through so that you've got that piece. But one of the questions is, you know, who played with you as a child? Who sang to you? Do you recall a game that that person played with you or a song that was sung to you? How did it feel at the time? And how does it feel now to recall it? And I think that's a really good place to start because I always ask myself the question, how did I experience something and how do I wish it had been done? Okay. And maybe the answer is, I wish it was done exactly as it was. I'm really happy with that. Fantastic. At least I know that going forward. But if I go, you know, this is how I was played or not played with, or this is how I was disciplined and this is how it made me feel. Here's how I wish it was done. Isn't that a great starting point? with our own children now. So understanding the stages of play is really important. And it doesn't matter if you're watching or listening now and you're thinking, well, my child is nine and she's talking about younger play because actually it's equally important when your child is nine, 10, 11, 14, 15, to go back and understand, did they go through these stages of developmental play? And if not to find the way of closing that gap, that's not to regress your teenager to a younger stage, but simply to find a way of doing that stage of play at their developmental level. So stage one developmental play is about, and this is really infancy up to three and a half years old. Don't worry about six months either side of this. Honestly, there, I, there's no such thing as too much of this play. There is too little of it, but not too much. So don't be worried if you're like, oh gosh, my four-year-old still does that. Fantastic. Let them at it. Um, but it's sensory play. We call it embodiment because it's about the body, the skin, all about our senses. But this stage of play is I mean, you should know by looking at your child what they've been playing with. It should be all over them, the floor, the walls, the furniture. It's, it's messy, tactile, exploratory play. It's sound, water, bubbles, Play-Doh, um, you know, dry rice. It's music. And by music, I do mean your pots, pans and ladles. Um, it, you can get lovely instruments, but you don't have to. You can put dry pasta in a lunchbox and have them shake it. You can take your Pringles tube. I would encourage you to wrap it because otherwise a child thinks you're giving them a tube of crisps and you're not. Um, so, and put some dried peas and secure the lid. And it's a perfectly good percussion instrument. If you happen to have large tins, I, even if you were using baby formula or a large um, tub of something and you know you take the lid off, blow up a balloon, let the air out and stretch the, the latex over the top and secure it with pins, that's a nice thumb, thumb drum, finger drum. 
So there's lots of ways you can do this with what you have at home. And that's also really important to me in 15 minute parenting that nobody should read the books and feel, okay, I'll do that when I get to the shop to buy all of the props. It's not about that. It's about using you and what's in your house already to secure this but sensory play the reason and you, it, look i acknowledge because i hear from parents all the time and i post about sensory play i even did it just the other day on my instagram and people were like that sounds great but no way i can't cope <laughs> with that the mess the mess and i think if you are you know mess averse own that about yourself okay because this isn't again something nice for children this is essential if we don't show our children that we can contain and manage their external mess how do they know that they can bring their internal mess to us their that icky uncomfortable internal chaos how do they know that we can help them to contain and make sense of that so if you're mess averse there are ways there are cheat sheets around this you could do your finger painting by taking an art roll of paper. I personally tend to get rolls of wallpaper lining in the hardware store because it's readily available and really cheap and it's thick paper. It really lasts. So, and I cover the little play table completely, sell, you know, sellotape it underneath. So the table is wrapped and then all the finger painting can happen on the table and I just unwrap it at the end and it can go out. No mess. I do. Yeah. You know, you know, it's a great way of doing it. I think as well, like I was doing, we had, we had a sprinkle of snow here, a sprinkle of snow. <laughs> so it was like massive excitement, but it went very quickly. So we did an internal snow tray and that's just corn flour, flour, bread soda, whatever you have. And I put it in a baking tray and we were able to bury things and you can pour in water and make it a bit moist and do all kinds with it. But of course it spills everywhere. Of course it does. So, and someone said to me, no, oh, but flour is really hard to wipe up. It leaves that residue. And yes, that's true. Um, but you can also put down, even just take a refuse sack and cut it and lay it on the floor or again, wrap the table in it and just pour the flour onto it. So you're actually doing your tidy up as part. There are ways of making this happen. The point is it has to happen. Our children in doing this mess are really exploring touch and touch is essential for child development. But in that stage of play, they're also discovering an inside and an outside of themselves. They're discovering that they have a skin that contains them and marks where they end and the world and people outside of them begin. So it's a stage of play that's about containment, about boundaries, about limits. And that's so important at that age. This is where we lump in our terrible twos and our three nagers and all of that language. But actually, while that is parentally very challenging, it is developmentally very normal for children to do all of that. And it's very healthy. Um, once they begin to move out of that stage of play, they go into stage two, which is more about projective narrative play. This is more, I'm just grabbing something here beside me to show you, um, to illustrate that point. Here we go. The little characters. Okay, so you just take, it could be two trains, two dinos, two teddies, two dollies, two anything. And they have them talk to each other. And they do this serve and return over and back of conversation. And what's really healthy about this stage of play is to do this, I have to be able to consider a situation from another person's perspective or point of view at the same time as my own, because I have to do one voice, switch to the other, hit you with a problem, come back with a solution. I'm doing all of that type of play. So it's great for developing those essential life skills of critical thinking, solution-focused thinking, reciprocity, turn-taking, general civility. <laughs> Not that they nail it at four years old, guys, but it's like the, it's, be, it's being laid down at this stage. But also empathy. And this is so important because this is the stage of play where in order to consider a situation from a, another, and then as they grow into this, they bring in multiple points of view, I have to be able to step out of my experience and feel it from another person's perspective. That's the groundwork for empathy. And we have to have empathy in our children because we're talking about four-year-olds. That's when the capacity is laid down. But if we short circuit this stage of play, and frequently we do because that kind of four, four and a half, five, that age group is typically when we are most likely to give them a screen-based device to occupy and distract them. 
and I can do a little bit about screens and give ourselves a break. Not all screens are created equal. There are always ways to offset that. We are parenting in a pandemic. Screens <laughs> are it with us. So don't worry about that. But if we give them just too much screen time and they don't get enough of this or any of this, what happens is watching Peppa and George play out a situation on a screen is not the same as holding Peppa and George and making them work that out because one happens to me and one happens of me. The one that happens of me is where I'm drawing that developmental benefit because I'm coming up with it. I'm making the connections. Whereas if I just watch it, I'm just being virtually cognitively stimulated and I'm not able to join those dots up and say, oh, well, that'll be the critical thinking right there now. And oh, would you look at Peppa mentalizing her way out of that? Well done, Peppa. That's not what happens <laughs> at all, of course. Um, but this stage of play is the one that's getting short circuited most, I would say. Okay. We have young children with impoverished access to this and they're being catapulted forward without developing those important social skills and that will quickly translate into a 14 year old engaged in cyber bullying or engaged in you know because I don't have the empathy or the critical thinking or not able to cope with everyday anxiety situations or everyday challenges so we do want to make sure of that and then the third stage that takes them from five five and a half up to seven years old is role play so everything I took in in stage one about me and the world outside of me, and I pushed out in stage two onto my little small world. Now I insert myself into in stage three. So I am the teacher or student. I am the doctor or patient. I am the parent or child. I'm in role, but it's a dramatic stage of play. So when you walk by the bedroom and you hear them roaring abuse at their babies, it's not that they think you're a tyrannical parent and that's what they're playing out. It's that they're wondering if I was in charge, how big and bad could I be? What could I get away with? If I was setting the rules, what could be possible here? So it's about power and it's about finding their place and voice in the world. It is dramatic. And just as you're not the tyrannical parent, when they line the teddies against the wall and roar abuse at them as a teacher, that's not a sign that we need to go in and talk to our teachers about what on earth is going on in the classroom. It's a sign that they're pushing boundaries. And then they are capable of self-regulation. Now, it's not guys that they wake up on their seventh birthdays, nailed it. You know, it's not like that. It's developmental age over chronological because you might well have a nine-year-old who emotionally is a little younger. Then I wouldn't expect your nine-year-old to be emotionally self-regulating. If they're emotionally six, parent them in that way. Meet them where they're at so that they get back on track and catch up. And they will. It does pan out, generally speaking, unless you have other you know, neurodiverse -ish, um, concerns to, to play with there. Children do find their footing with this, but they don't develop in this kind of linear, rote way. Every child has their own rhythm, their own pattern, and their own way of experiencing the world. And you know why? Because all of us parents are not the same. And we bring a lot to this party too, and our own stuff to this. So just as we ask ourselves, did my child do this? Did my child do that? Have a think about, do I remember doing that? Do I remember playing like that? And as I said, there are ways of, of closing those gaps because a gap in any of these stages of play, it may not derail your child, you know, but have you ever tried walking with a pebble in your shoe? Of course, you can still walk, but it would be a lot more comfortable if you stopped to shake the pebble out. And if you leave the pebble in there, it'll eventually give you a blister and cause you a problem. So while those gaps won't derail your child's development, they will emotionally function in a healthier way if we find ways to close those gaps for them at whatever age they're at. But early childhood, I always think of it in our parenting journey as that place where our children are in love with us. You know, they think we're fantastic and that we have all the answers and, you know, there's nobody like, you know, mum or dad. And then in middle childhood, they get a little more cynical about us, that eight to 12 year old age group. You know, they're saying they ask us their questions. Yes. But now they're doubting and going, should I check that with someone else? Should we Google that? Are you sure that's the answer? So they're a little more cynical about us because their focus is shifting from us as their important hub of social development towards peer group. And then in adolescence, they're not cynical about us. They're just flat out disappointed in us. We are utterly underwhelming to our teenagers. We know nothing. We don't get it. We were never teenagers. And it's a process of them pulling away from us 
so that they can go through a phase of separation and individuation to then find their way back to us. Easy for me to say, very difficult to parent through and to, the idea of keeping play alive because we tend to stop playing with our nine, 10, 11 year olds. It becomes about bikes and scooters and game consoles and skates and thing, you know, team things like rounders and that type of play. And that's fine, but we still have to do the connection play. And with our teenagers, we tend to not play with them. We tend to just walk on eggshells. And so with that connection with teenagers then, is there anything specific that you recommend for that particular age group? Yeah, I would do a whole lot about creative communication and playfulness. So and in, in the book, the third book, The Teenage Years, I have filled it with play, by the way, and only activities because I work with a lot of teenagers that I have done myself. So I haven't put anything in for someone to go, I don't know what teenager she's talking about. No teenager <laughs> would do that. I promise you teenagers do this. But sometimes it's our resistance to the play. You know, we think, I can't imagine doing that with a teenager. So I turn that into my teenager won't do it. But actually, if I go in going, I don't think you're going to do this, but I'm going to try. Everything about me says this is uncomfortable and awkward. If it feels awkward, it's awkward. So I've filled it with um, activities, creative communication, like emotional fluency just comes to mind because I've mentioned it at the beginning. And it's very important with teenagers who do spend a lot of time communicating through digital devices. And I do activities like taking Jenga blocks and writing little phrases with a Sharpie on them. Something that excites me is, something that makes me laugh is, something that frightens me, something that upsets me, something that makes me angry. And I fill the blocks and as we play Jenga, we have to complete the sentence that's on the block when we take it out. So that's a way of doing it. With younger children, I also use the Jenga blocks and either buy the colored ones or just color them in. And every color has a feeling. And when you put the block out, you talk about a time you had that feeling. So it's a way of growing the play up. And emotional fluency can be done through uh, storytelling activity too where I tell my teenager I'm going to tell you a story it should be short because you're going to say it three times but it should be meaningful and something you have a strong feeling about you're very happy very angry very sad you have a strong feeling about it the first time you tell them the story you only want them looking at your face and they're going to note down pen and paper facial expression furrowed brow eyebrows clenched jaw. They're going to look at things on your face and note it down. The second time, they're going to look at your body, hunched shoulders, leaning back, folded arms, uh, tapping twiddly fingers. They're going to notice body reactions. And the third time, they listen just to the words. And they're going to listen to the types of phrases you're using, the types of words, and your tone of voice. So the prosody, pitch, pace, tone of voice. At the end, you simply say, how was I feeling about that story? And they say, oh, you're feeling really angry or frustrated, but they have to tell you how. Because your face, because your body, because your voice. So you're teaching them that communication is more than words. It's what's not said as well as what's said, but you're doing it through activities. So there's everything from that. And I've also in the teenage book included some madder things like leg wrestling instead of arm wrestling. Um, more challenging because challenge is the older your child is, the more challenge based play you do. Um, a skipping activity uh, where you have to hold a cup of water and the, the winner is whoever has the most water in the cup at the end of 10 skips each or something like that. So we're doing the activity, but with inherent challenge in it. Okay. That's great. Thank you. One other thing I wanted to touch on was the topic of transition. So whether that's um, your child of, of any age really struggling to transition between activity or getting out the door, um, to go to the shops or even, um, which will be the case for a lot of people in the community, transitioning between parents' households and how you kind of incorporate play um, to help children deal, deal with that. Yeah, and some children will struggle more than others. And you may even find if you've got more than one child that you've one child who doesn't and one child who does. And you're, how's this happening? Um, particularly uh, children who are a little more sensitive might actually struggle a bit more with this because they have that need to, to understand and to have more control over what's going on. If you have a child who does like to have that over control, transitions can be very tricky. But also hold in mind that if your child is doing something, and they're really enjoying what they're doing. And you come in saying, well, now our time is up, we gotta go, or it's time to go and collect your sibling, or it's time to go get your bag, or whatever it is. Frankly, 
that's not interesting to me and I just don't want to. So I may be so absorbed in my play that it looks like I'm being defiant and not listening to you, but actually I can't hear you. I'm just so absorbed. I'm not taking in your words. So the first thing you're going to do about transitions is come down to their eye level. Make sure you get that connection. Try to get a hand on them. It could be a hand lightly on a shoulder or gently touching their hand and you say, hey, and they look and you say, you're having so much fun. You've been playing at this for so long and I can see you're really enjoying it. So this is the first time I'm going to tell you we have to stop now and go. And in two minutes, I'll come back and remind you, but then we have to go for real, okay? So you let them finish what they're doing for the two minutes because if you just say, stop what you're doing, I might be in the middle of a really important part of my game or a really important page of my book. Um, and they know they can finish that up, wrap it up, wind it down. Here's the second time you come in, you gotta go, okay? Um, I like to do three steps because I think it's enough, A, B, and C. Okay, we're going to do this, then this, then this. That's it. Then when you get to the third thing, you go, great, we did really well. Now we're going to do the next, the next, the next. Rather than saying, come on, we have to do this, get down, get our bags, get out, get to the car, pick up this, do because your child is immediately overwhelmed. So three steps. I tend to use uh, visual charts as well. So taking like a piece of paper, it could be poster card, and breaking it into six or eight boxes. Eight is a max because it's enough to hold in mind. And I draw out the stages of the routine. Say it's morning time, it might be a picture of waking up, eating breakfast, brushing teeth, getting dressed. How do we get to school or daycare or wherever you're going? Maybe it's the car, maybe it's bikes, maybe it's walking. A picture of that. A picture that represents me in school or at play or wherever I am when I'm not with you that represents me there. Then one that has me coming back to you that shows us reconnecting, could be doing homework, having a snack, and then bedtime so that my day is broken into boxes. And when I'm in school and getting dysregulated, I don't have to think, well, it's 12.30 now and I have 90 minutes before I get home because that's too complicated. I'm in school, the next box is getting home to you. I'm one box away from you. So I can self-regulate that, but equally at home, when I'm downstairs and I've eaten my breakfast and now I'm playing while eating my breakfast and you're saying, did you get dressed? Did you get dressed? And they're eating their breakfast. You could say, hey, check the chart. Where are we at? Remind me. Breakfast. Oh, what's next? Getting dressed. You're dead right. Absolutely. Go get dressed. So it helps to keep them on track more using charts. And you can apply that visual chart to any transition, even if it's moving between your two respective homes. And another way of doing that is to draw out on the chart something that represents your house and the other house and a pathway between them. And take photo of both of you, the children, whoever's involved, take photos, cut them out and put a bit of blue tack behind them so that you can physically locate everybody in the house they're in and then begin the process of moving who's going to what house, okay? And then they know that that's a pathway that brings me between my homes, okay? And when I go to one, I will be finding my way back. And that's really important when they're back with you then that you put their little blue tack people back in your house or you let them do it. And it was something I've done myself in my clinic, working with children in lots of different family constructions. You know, it could be separated parents, but it also could be children who are in care or, you know, between different homes anyway, is I had two dolls houses, uh, not expensive ones, just fairly basic. And actually the more basic, the better. These were just wooden structure houses. I got two identical houses because I didn't want anything that said, well, here's the big house and here's the small house or anything like that. But what I did was I painted the roofs different colors. So one had a red roof and one had a blue roof. So they knew they were different houses. And I would play out with them moving between houses. And what was that like? And normalizing it because children, particularly young children, when they get to externalize it and play it out at a removed level, they get to integrate the learning from that play and to help them to make sense and regulate it. So anything like that. I also think one of the things that comes up particularly around separated families is that when you're co-parenting, children forget things. They forget the stuff in one parent's house that should be that they need and that can be a cause of tension. And then they know that that's something to worry about and they're already anxious. So it's easier to say, I don't wanna go. 
it's just easier to have all my stuff here and that's it. So anything that you can duplicate, do. There will be things you can't, of course, cost-wise and just practicality, but having sets of everything and as parents taking responsibility, particularly for the younger children, at making a checklist. What's the schedule? What's expected? What do we need? Let's tick off our list. Do we have everything? And making that part of your routine. And then transitions that are just difficult for children in general to move from one task to another. I always think about the, the school setting and children who transition from classroom to outdoor play, getting back into the classroom. They can be hotbeds of tension for lots of children because it's very hard to move from Woo, you know, lots of excitement and running around. And then many schools, not all, but many have them stand in a line before they go back. Into the class. And that is not a natural inclination for any child to stand in a line for a period of minutes and they're counted and then they're brought back in. At least two, ch at least two children in that line are going to start hitting the child in front or behind them or jostling or shit. Because actually what they're saying is I'm still feeling fidgety and I want to move. If you have a child who struggles with that, talk to your teacher and see can they either go at the very end of the line so their waiting time is minimal or be the very first in the line so they know they're about to move in um, and make them a classroom helper if they're struggling with classroom transitions so that they're the one to gather up the worksheets or distribute the worksheets or hand out the little bowls of crayons or whatever it is that they're there to do because actually the sitting still waiting for the teacher to hand those out that waiting period that's when the transition goes off track okay. but if you keep me active in it that's going to be something. I also play with it, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to wherever we go and we have to march or I'll say we can only hop on one leg. Everybody pick their leg, let's hop to the door. Everybody, whatever it is that we do that or let's do funny walks. We're going to stomp like dinosaurs to move where we're going and never leave home without bubbles. When it's all going terribly wrong, not if, when it's all going terribly wrong, break out the bubbles. I don't mean the drinking bubbles. I mean the blowing bubbles. No judgment. There's a, there's a time and a place for those bubbles too. But the blowing bubbles, little party pack, put them in your pocket, your handbag, your glove box. I would have them, every, everything I have has bubbles in it. Because actually when I don't want to get in the car, I don't want to do that, blow the bubbles and see, can you catch the bubbles? Can you pop them with just your pinky? Can you stomp on them with your feet? Can you wave them with your elbows? raising the challenge. Can you chase them all the way to the car? Can you hold the wand, not the bubbles, the wand, while I just get you into the car? Use your bubbles and that's going to be helpful. I love that. That's a good idea. And so throughout the book then, there's so many kind of 15 minute practice um, examples and ideas uh, to incorporate into the day. What would you say, um, I guess, is your favourite 15 minute practice from each age oh. group? If oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, that's, that's a, what I think, you know, is really helpful is to have something that, because we're talking about transitions and routines, something as well as on my mind, you've mentioned about separation and saying goodbye. Um, when you're doing that with your child, because you're doing it a lot, you know, when they're going to their other parent or whatever it might be, is to have a four part handshake as part of your play, okay? And a four part, I mean, you could do a six part handshake or an eight part. I just know my limits and remembering four parts is probably enough for me. But you start with just a handshake and then you invite your child to put in a piece and they might do a high five. And then you practice that and then you put in a piece and it might be this. So now you've got this, 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 and then they do another piece and it might be a fist bump. And you practice it and practice it. And every time at the point of separation, you do your handshake and at the point of reunification before you say anything you do your handshake that's play it's playful connection i think that can be a really nice thing um i think when you're in transition when you're on the move it could be going to school or you know moving between homes uh, have a song that you sing in the car that is your special song so you're cueing them in a doing not saying way soon we will be saying goodbye. So they know, oh, we're singing our song. The next thing we'll do is our handshake and then I'm going to be going. But they know it. You know, they have that control with it. And you can sing like that. The other thing I think is really that I love with the play to do is, you know, when we get our kids back and we haven't seen them. And again, it could be the school day or it could be they spent the weekend away from you. And you just want to, what did you do? Where did you go? Who did you see? What happened? How are you feeling? Was it okay? Did you me? Did you eat? Did you, do? and you just want to, and your child is literally going, zoom, 
And so they say, nothing. I did nothing. I know nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And you're going, what happened? And we go into that place of not knowing. But actually, the whole point of 15-minute parenting is to stay in a place of not knowing, but seeking to understand. Before you do any of that, co-regulate. Play jelly and ice cream. You could do fish and chips. You could do chicken and chips. You could do anything you like. Jelly and ice cream. Every time I say jelly, you would say ice cream, but you have to say it the same way that I do. So if I say jelly, you yell back ice cream or jelly, ice cream, or jelly, ice cream, and do all your funny voices. So if your child is coming back to you and they're quite flat, quite low energy, start quiet and bring it up. If they come back to you and they are like high as kites and bouncing off the ceiling, don't judge who gave them how much sugar. Meet them where they're at and start yelling your jelly and bring it down into this comfortable window, okay? You will easily do five minutes at that activity and then they're in the window as you and you say, so how was your weekend? Because I'm with you now. You have to get that connection first. And I would daily in my house do Dance the Moody's Away. That's a favorite for me. You know, um, in the old days when we used to leave our houses to go to work, but, um, you know, and you get in and you've barely got your coat off and they're all like, I need you. He did this. She did that. I want to show you something. And you're just going, I'm not there yet. Is to drop your bag, your coat, hit play on your Spotify list or whatever you're using and whatever comes on if it's the Rolling Stones or if it's Disney, it doesn't matter. For the duration of that song, everybody dances. And I mean flailing limbs, wacky, silly dancing. Dance like nobody's looking because they're not. And at the end of that, there's been that physical release. And it works because rhythm and synchrony trigger the subsystems of the brain associated with emotional regulation. You are out of your heads and you're using your bodies to move. So you get that relaxation of muscle too and you co-regulate in sync. So I would do handshake jelly ice cream and also um, uh, dance the Moody's away as daily activities um, in, in my house. But I would also have balloons in the press because you can take a blanket, blow up a balloon, everybody hold a bit of the balloon make sure you take charge of calling one name at a time and everybody works to tilt the blanket to move the balloon to that person and send it back. Everyone gets a go, keep the balloon on the blanket and do hot potato, cold potato. When it's hot, you shake it. And when it's cold, you just wave it. And hot and, and up and down. It's all about establishing this emotional regulatory roller coaster with your play. If you bring your kids up, you gotta know how you're bringing them back down. That's on us, not them. <laughs> That's very true, very true. I think the um the dancing one is is really important and that is definitely the go-to in my house. Um yeah. The point my mum actually sent us the other day um in the post a glitter ball, one of those disco balls. Oh yeah, lovely. So now we've got that for the dance as well, then it, it just switches the mood. It really helps. Oh, it totally does. And it's nice even with your older children because you can make it about, you know, learning something from a TikTok dance and yeah. meet them what they're interested in and, and doing that with them and meeting them in their interest. I think that's really important. But rhythm and synchrony, that's what you need. And with younger kids, it's why we clap handies. You know, we clap handies, clap handies, we, because it's rhythm and synchrony. It keeps us together. Perfect. Yeah. I just, I'm conscious of time and I just want to um, see if anyone has any questions while we're on. And um, you could either drop it in the chat or unmute yourself and, and anything you want to ask Joanna while we're here. We may have covered everyone's, everyone's questions. I did talk a lot at you guys, yeah. It's brilliant though, it's all so valuable. Um, While we're waiting on a question, I might just say something about the sensitive child because I mentioned sensitive yes. earlier and I didn't go into it. And if you have a sensitive child, you don't need to pause to wonder, you know, you have one. And I think in our societies, you know, we tend to give sensitivity a bad rep. You know, we say, oh, you're so sensitive. Don't be so sensitive. But actually sensitivity can be a superpower because it enables you to feel things at a deeper level that you can read a situation and a room very quickly but it's very difficult to be a sensitive child because you don't yet have that filter between what's your stuff and what's someone else's so you can be vulnerable to feeling overwhelmed 
very quickly, but like a sponge that soaks up all the emotional resonance in the room. But a sponge that gets too wet isn't a sponge anymore. It's just soggy. You need to pick it up and wring it out. So those children often need us to help them break down their day. I would start with what was the best bit of your day? What bit would you like to change? Don't do worse bits, but what bit would you like to change? Because you, and you share the same back. So it's highs and it's lows. Our children who are sensitive tend to feel things at that too much level. Do you know, they're not sad, they're devastated. They're not angry, they're enraged. You know, they're not worried, they're strung out anxious. You know, they, everything just seems to be amplified. So breaking it down into bite-sized pieces and asking them to tell you the story of their feeling. So it becomes a relational episode and don't judge it or jump in to rescue and fix it. Just reflect back what you've heard and ask the important question. Is there something that you'd like me to do to help with that? I'd also make a post box. I just use a shoe box, by the way, an elastic band, keep it together, cut a little hole and they can post their worries or wonderings or questions into it. And at night we can take two out and spend 15 minutes reflecting on that worry or that thing that they're feeling very sensitive about but it also contains it so it doesn't spiral huge and they know that every day they're going to get to check in with you about that yeah that's great i like that i've got a couple of questions coming in um so which is your best book to buy for a nearly three-year-old the zero to seven. So the first book, it has the blue cover and that will cover all of those attachment formation, early developmental play and the parental self audit in there. So that's definitely the one you need. Perfect. And then the next one um, question is around solo play. So my child is an only child and I'm trying to work from home as well as be her teacher and entertainer. Is it okay to encourage solo play? And um, just thinking of mum guilt, which we, we all have it. Oh, um, we all have that, yeah. And the child is nearly six. Okay, I was just gonna ask about the age. So I also have a single child and um, you know, her question every morning is, you know, so who's gonna play with me today? You know, not who's gonna parent me, who's going to play with me? And uh, you know, we're also trying to encourage a little bit. The younger child, you know, really under four, having 20 minutes of solo play is, is really their limit. And that, then they need to come in and check, are you still here, what are you doing? what's happening and they might need a bit of structuring and redirection. Um, at six, I would expect them to be capable of at least 20 minute bursts, if not half hour bursts of solo play. But your child may need a little structuring with that. So give me a task, you know, suggest I do something, um, suggest I write, I draw out a story. So with the six year olds, what I might do is take a, just like an A4 piece of paper and break it into, six boxes okay so literally like that okay and ask them in the first box to draw a character give them a name the second box give the character something to do you know in all stories the character has something to do the third box who might try and get in the way of them doing that the fourth box who might help them the fifth box what's the big exciting moment the drama of the story and the sixth one is how does it end get them to draw out a story OK, and then when they want to show it to you, you just say to them, now tell me the story once upon a time and they tell it out. So they get that brief connection back with you and then you have them do something else. But you, if you struck, that's one example now. But, you know, if you structure it, it can be helpful. I also use sensory bowls when I want to do that. And it might be a dry one. Take a baking bowl and fill it with uncooked uh, red and green lentils, lima beans and, you know, the bow tie shaped pasta that looks like butterflies fill it up with that stuff and I hide things like Lego or 10 cent pieces, depends on if you have a monetary motivated child, you know, something like that and have them dig with their hands to find the bits, pour from one to the other and just play. Give them something to do if your child struggles. Generally speaking, by six, seven years old, I, I want them able to self-entertain and find things to do. So we often sabotage our children's boredom by entertaining them and distracting them. And if your child says, but I don't know what to do, you can say, well, you can sit there until you come up with something and I can't wait to see what you're gonna do. I'm so excited to see what you come up with. And even if they sit there for 20 minutes before they find something to do, the finding something to do is the important piece. Because if we keep going in and always setting it up and always structuring it, 
they'll never do it. They'll always default to us, tell me what to play. So you only structure it if you have a child who's really struggling until they don't need you to do that. Generally, I'd be saying, would you look at everything you've got in there between books and jigsaws and toys and props and gadgets and gizmos, you'll find something to do. And you just make yourself unavailable that you need the time. I need 20 minutes. Again, think of your timer. I need this much time. And you've got all of this time to find something to do yourself. So I would want the solo play. But again, just to come back to the screen piece on that, because if you've got something that you have to do with work, you don't have the time to be doing what I'm saying, negotiating and going into them and saying, of course you can and do this and do that. If you have them watch a movie, if you need an hour, on a call, give them a list, especially at six now, but give a list of household items and a pen. And as they watch their movie, they have to tick off when they see a cup, when they see a spoon, when they see a chair, whatever it might be, a whole list, put in some obscure items too. And as they're watching their movie, they're doing a scavenger hunt to find the things on the list. After your call or whatever you've had to do, you come in and go, so let's check the list. What did you see? What wasn't there? What was there? And you get to go through it. And then you can set up something else by saying, now, if you were the director of that movie and you could say, cut, what scene would you cut? And what would you put in instead? And how would that change the movie? Why don't you draw out that scene and draw out the new ending? So again, you've taken the time I've been on a screen, but you've now made it an engagement activity. I love that. And actually we've touched on screen time a couple of times through, through the session. Um, and I think it's something maybe we're all struggling with as we yeah. kind of navigate our way through this pandemic. Should we talk about screen time and different ages? Yes. Um, look, all screens are not created equal. If you've got a TV on in a sitting room that also has jigsaws, books and toys thrown around, a child is likely to watch a bit and play a bit and watch a bit and play a bit. That's not the same as staring into a, a, a tablet on my lap, which is sucking me entirely in and I've got blinkers on and I'm completely oblivious to anything outside of it. Um, offsetting the damage like that, taking down the duvet from the bed and making a bowl of popcorn and snuggling up together and watching a movie and feeding each other and have you've made it a nurture activity. That's not the same. Um, doing the scavenger hunt, doing the director activity, how would you change this movie? Uh, finding a book that's connected, even if it's not like a Disney thing that you have the story and the movie, even if it was a, a children's show and there was a theme in it and you have a book about trains or about buildings or about whatever it is, then reading the book about that and then asking them to play out with little miniature animals the story they've just watched or little miniature toys you're offsetting that impact you're taking it from just the screen and bringing it into my play world there are lots of ways of diluting the impact of screens but the biggest thing is we have to shake off the guilt because we are all doing the very best that we can at the moment and screens have become a more dominant part of our lives. And to be honest, they've been a, a lifeline for many of us. It's allowed our children to maintain connections with other parents, with grandparents, with their peers. And the technology has been fantastic. But with the best will in the world, virtual interactions cannot replicate in-person, relational, intersubjective connection because you don't get that serve and return piece that you get in the, in the real world through the screen. So they're a short-term solution, not long-term. And I just think try to do playful, creative ways to offset some of the impact. But please don't be saying, oh my gosh, I'm the worst parent ever. My child spent an hour and a half online. I'm looking at going, every parent out there is having that inner monologue. You are not alone with that. And look, you have to get stuff done. You have to work so that you can provide for you and your child. You have to cover a bit of school with them and you have to parent. And we're supposed to do all of these things like we're not doing any of the other. We're supposed to teach like we're not working, work like we're not parenting, and parent like we haven't just been a drill sergeant teacher all morning. Like We're just setting ourselves up to fail. So I think we'll have our good days and our bad days. Perfection is not good enough. Good enough is good enough. And that means making mistakes and going back to our kids and saying, do you know what? My feelings got a bit loud this morning. 
and I'm really sorry that I yelled or I used a loud voice and I think you got scared and I felt frustrated and it wasn't about you. I couldn't get the computer to work to get your schoolwork and I got mad and I think I was grumpy and I'm really sorry. And here's what I wish I did instead. Can I have a do-over? Our children are so forgiving of our parental transgressions. They will give us do-overs, but we're also teaching them that when we come apart, that we can find our way back, that our relationship is stronger than the row. That's lovely. I love that. And I think we've got no other questions. So um, unless there's anything that you just want to add before we finish up, um, no, I, we've covered immense ground. Um, I'm sorry, the sun suddenly came up. I was aware I was like, you know, I'm either looking like I'm being interrogated in a police station with a lamp over my head or there's no light at all. Um, but no, we covered a lot and I really enjoyed talking to you guys about all of this. Um, and I, I really think that the, the, what I wanted with 15 Minute Parenting was not to create yet another thing that busy parents have to do. You know, here comes the play, um, but actually to look at creating creative ways to embed it into your existing routines. And so that's in there. This is a roadmap for actually discovering therapeutic, playful parenting and looking at what are you like driving in the car, you know, standing in a line, queuing somewhere, sitting in a waiting room. What are things that you can do in what you're already doing? So I really don't want anyone to feel like here's yet another thing I have to fit in. It shouldn't feel like that. If it is, then it hasn't been clear enough. So there are lots of ways of embedding this into your busy routine. Perfect, yeah, I agree. And I'm, I'm off to buy a 15 minute timer, I think. <laughs> oh, I swear by these guys. And mine is like, phone. yeah, it's so durable. Them. But, you know, to say kind of in two minutes, like this is what we're gonna do and I'll put the two minute timer on. But actually listening to you talk, I'm like, oh, I need the physical timer. And 15 minutes, like you can get these up to 30 minutes, but a 30 minute timer, I kind of feel like that's a whole other issue if you need a 30 minute timer. 15 minutes for me seems enough. And I have a five minute one as well that I just got in one of the, you know, the high street stores, yeah. Tiger, Flying Tiger. But it, it's, it is breakable. I will say it's big, but this one oh. is bulletproof. Like I've had this years and I use these in my clinic instead of, clocks because kids don't read time and you know this will survive anything the only thing is put it out of reach because kids are creative um not manipulative creative and as soon as your back is turned they'll flip it and go oh look the time is still going so that you make sure they can see it but not touch it <laughs> perfect all right well thank you so much again for your time we really appreciate it and um yeah highly recommend the book for thank you for the relevant ages for your kid you know I'm, I'm really enjoying it and yeah that was really valuable thank you thanks guys all right speak to you later bye, bye. thank bye. you <laughs>